Hello all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another amazing Florida tent. I'm here today at Fort DeSoto because it's one of the most interesting fortifications in the state. It's located at the mouth of Tampa Bay. It was constructed between 1898 and 1906 in response to the Spanish-American War. That conflict lasted only four months and by the time it was over only the foundations of this fort had been created. Over the past 458 years, Europeans and later Americans would build dozens of forts all throughout Florida, although only about 10 would be more than temporary. Today I'll take a look at those built by the French and the Spanish, as well as those created during the Seminole Wars, America's most expensive and longest lasting Indian Wars. So join me as I look at Fortified Florida. Enjoy! I'm going to approach this by introducing the 10 fortifications in more or less chronological order. This is easy for some as they have a very clear construction date, but some not only have multiple errors of construction, they're tied to settlements that predate any real defensive activity. I start with what is, not surprisingly, the first European fort in what we now call Florida. Amazing Florida Fort Number 1. Caroline and its massacres. Shown in early drawings as a small triangular stockade of rough hewn logs surrounded by moats and the St. John's River, the French fort was constructed in 1564, a year before the Spanish founded its first settlement at St. Augustine. Named Fort Caroline for the French king, Charles IX, it was the second European fort in North America the first being an earlier but failed attempt of a French settlement on the Carolina coast. That first settlement was founded by Jean Rabot in 1562 after Ribot had explored and charted much of the coast from northern Florida to the Carolinas. It's believed that the explorer placed a monument along the shore of the St. John's near the ocean, possibly near the current site of this monument to Rabot dedicated in 1924. When the Carolina settlement failed, Rabot's second-in-command, René de Guilain de Laudinaire, returned to the St. John's location and in 1564 established Fort Caroline. Rabot, who had been temporarily imprisoned in Britain's Tower of London, was chosen to lead a relief expedition to Fort Caroline and arrived there in 1565. Meanwhile, the Spanish learned of the nascent French settlement and its potentially vast land grab. The Spanish had already claimed much of South America and the Caribbean for their own and considered the Florida Peninsula and indeed the North American continent their domain, so they rushed to found their own nearby settlement in what would become St. Augustine. It was inevitable that the two European superpowers would come in conflict in Florida. While it didn't escalate to an actual war, it was certainly one of the most violent conflicts in Florida's history. The Spanish commander, Pedro Menendez de Aviles, and his small fleet of ships briefly engaged the French ships near the mouth of the St. John's, though the French were able to escape. Menendez would then head south and create a settlement by fortifying a Timucua village at present-day St. Augustine. Rabot would attack the Spanish ships off St. Augustine, but couldn't enter the inlet, so they headed south in pursuit of Menendez's flagship. The French got caught in a hurricane and foundered. Believing that Fort Caroline was left defenseless, Menendez took a small force by land, during the hurricane, to attack and destroy the fort. Since they not only considered the French Protestants invadees but religious heretics, Menendez killed 140 men at the fort, allowing only about 60 women and children to live. Meanwhile, Rabot and his men were shipwrecked south of the Spanish settlement and had little choice but to march towards St. Augustine. 
After destroying Fort Caroline, Menendez and his troops made it back to their fort and soon marched along the barrier island to engage the French forces. They met up with an initial group as the French had divided themselves in two. Although this group surrendered, Menendez put to death each one that wasn't Catholic. A few days later, they met the second group, and Menendez did the same. Rabot and about 350 of his men lost their lives in the two massacres. The inlet where this happened was later named Matanzas, the Spanish word for slaughter. I cover this incident in more detail in this video. By the way, in 2014, it was suggested that Fort Caroline wasn't located near present-day Jacksonville, but was further north along the Altamaha River in southeast Georgia. This was determined by a study of early maps, among other evidence. While there's currently no archaeological evidence showing that Fort Caroline was that far north, there's no real archaeological evidence to place it on the St. John's, either. However, the northern location might have made the timeline of events between Rabot and Menendez difficult to reconcile. While the St. John's is only 40 miles or 64 kilometers north of St. Augustine, at 115 miles, the Altamaha River is nearly three times further away. Amazing Florida Fort Number 2 San Marcos de Appalach and the Execution of Two British Citizens Located near the Gulf of Mexico, at the point where the Wakula and St. Mark's Rivers meet, this historic site sits directly south of Tallahassee. In 1679, the Spanish built a wooden fort at the site in order to protect the river as well as possible incursions into Florida by the British. Named San Marcos de Apalache for the Catholic St. Mark, as well as the local tribe of indigenous people, the Apalache, that fort was reportedly destroyed by pirates. In 1718, another wooden fort was built and a small settlement grew up around it. By the 1740s, the Spanish began adding stone walls to the fort. Progress was slow, however, and tragedy stuck in 1758 when a hurricane flooded the fort and the garrison of 40 men were drowned. The Spanish brought in new troops, but at the end of the Seven Years' War, Florida was ceded to Britain and the unfinished stone fort was abandoned. Twenty years later, the Spanish once again took control of Florida and moved troops back into the still unfinished fort. From 1783 until 1821, when Spain relinquished control of the territory for the last time, the military held control of San Marcos. In 1800, William Augustus Bowles, a leader of a large group of indigenous warriors, mostly Creek and Seminoles, as well as former slaves and mercenaries, declared war on Spain while trying to establish their own independent country in the Florida Panhandle. That year, Bowles laid siege to San Marcos, but the timely arrival of nine Spanish warships drove off the attackers. While the Spanish were able to win that battle, they simply didn't have the numbers of soldiers to patrol the long border with what was now the United States. Florida was a barely developed buffer to the rapidly growing country to the north. It was in these circumstances that Americans were quickly becoming accustomed to crossing the border for any number of reasons, including trying to recapture escaped slaves. It got to a point where even the U.S. Army was willing to enter the Spanish territory. General Andrew Jackson, later the seventh president, instructed his troops to invade Florida more than once. In 1817, Jackson personally led his troops in an invasion that seized Fort San Marcos. At the fort, Jackson captured two British citizens, Robert Arbuthnot and Alexander Armbrister. Jackson suspected both men of gun running and supplying the indigenous tribes and escaped slaves with weapons. A U.S. military tribunal tried them, found them guilty, and sentenced them to death. But the court then remitted the sentence and ordered public lashings and a year in prison. General Jackson overrode the determination and had both men executed. Known as the Arbuthnot Ambrister Incident, the situation caused a crisis with both Britain and Spain, and the issue was taken up in the U.S. Congress. While a congressional investigation found fault with Jackson's handling of the situation, he was popular and powerful general, and Congress chose not to punish him. 
About a year afterwards, Jackson's men abandoned the fort to head west and attack Pensacola. The Spanish reclaimed San Marcos, but would leave it in 1821 when the U.S. finally took official possession of Florida. Amazing Florida Fort No. 3, Mose, the first legally sanctioned community of free blacks in North America. While the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine is the most visited of Florida's forts, a mere two miles or three kilometers north is the location of one of the least visited fort sites in the state. However, the Castillo, which I discussed in this video, and Fort Mose were linked in a common cause. Located in the outskirts of the Spanish outpost, the settlement was founded in 1738 on land that was provided by Florida's governor, Manuel de Montiano. The inhabitants of the new settlement were enslaved individuals who had escaped from the British colonies to the north. The former slaves found their way to Spanish Florida through an escape route that long predated the well-known Underground Railroad, which people used to escape to the northern U.S. and Canada. While we have few records about how many fugitive slaves entered Florida and how they ended up surviving, there's two significant aspects we do understand. The first is that they simply did what the indigenous peoples did in Georgia and South Carolina as they were being driven out of their ancestral lands by English settlers. Both the indigenous peoples, the ancestors of today's Seminole and Miccosukee tribes, and the slaves would have crossed the border and melted into the forests and wetlands. The other path was a coastal route which would lead to St. Augustine and Spanish protection. The territory was willing to accept the newly arrived escaped slaves because it was the northernmost settlement of Spanish America and had little support from the mother country. It was considered a buffer to the rapidly growing British settlements directly north. As such, any new manpower that could be added was appreciated. The Spanish had a process where blacks who had escaped from the British colonies could be put under royal protection and granted freedom a process that appears to have dated from around 1689. There were three things that the escaped slaves had to do. Convert to Catholicism, take Christian name, and agree to four years' service in the militia. Not surprisingly, plenty of the formerly enslaved agreed to the conditions. By 1738, the population of St. Augustine was approximately 1,500, including about 100 free blacks. Just outside the northern wall of the small city, there was an indigenous village which farmed and traded with the Spanish settlers. The new black settlement was built a little further north next to the Tolomato River. The settlement, which contained a simple square fort, would be the home of those 100 or so black refugees. The name of the new settlement was Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, or translated as the Royal Grace of Saint Teresa of Mose. Now, the royal grace part is understandable. The settlement was created by the grace of the Spanish royal governor. As for St. Teresa, I think we're most likely looking at Santa Teresa de Avila, who was canonized in 1622. The real issue arrives with the name Mose. Santa Teresa de Mose would typically mean Mose was a place name, as Avila is, the town where Teresa was born. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find any information on Mose. It doesn't appear to have been a Spanish place name, nor is it anything connected with Santa Teresa or Spanish Florida. I've spoken to staff at the Fort Mose in State Park, and they weren't able to provide any more information. Fort Mose not only provided the space for the black community to live and farm, but it served as a military outpost on the northern approach to St. Augustine. Any attack from British America would likely pass by or through the settlement. Indeed, only a year after its founding, Mose was to provide a critical role during the strangely named War of Jenkins' Ear, fought between the Spanish and British in 1739 and 40. And yes, that war was directly connected to a British sea captain, Robert Jenkins, and his ear, which was cut off by a Spanish privateer, Juan de Leon Fandino. Spanish scouts detected British and Georgian military troops advancing on Mose. 
the governor evacuated the fort and community, moving the residents to the safety of the Castillo de San Marcos. The British force of about 150 men took control of the abandoned fort, but only a couple days later, a larger Spanish force, including the residents of Mose, attacked the fort and routed the British, capturing and killing many, while the rest beat a hasty retreat back to Georgia. That was the end of the first Fort Mose, but the settlers rebuilt their town, including a new fort. Mose continued to be successful until 1763, when Florida was ceded to Britain. At that point, Mose's population was moved out of Florida to Cuba, so that none would be re-enslaved. Today, the site is a state park, and archaeological work has provided ample evidence of the first legally sanctioned community of free blacks in North America. While the fort and settlement are long gone, the location is one of the most important historical sites in Florida. Amazing Florida Fort Number 4 Barrancas, where the first shots of the Civil War were fired. Fort Barrancas, as we can see it today, has its origins in Spanish construction in 1793. The name is a Spanish term for canyon or ravine, and reflects the bluffs that were situated along the shore facing the entrance to Pensacola Harbor. The fort was one of several built to protect the Spanish city since the late 1600s. The Barrancas Water Battery was completed in 1797, and a long palisade was added to protect the fort from possible land assault. The advantage of a water battery is that cannonballs can be shot at a low trajectory, so that they skip across the water towards the target. This eliminates having to calculate the distance to the ship. If you point the cannon directly at a ship, you don't have to worry about balls falling short or overflying the ship. When the U.S. took over Florida from the Spanish in 1821, the Navy wanted to build a shipyard in Pensacola, so the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began work on several forts to protect the area. These included Fort Pickens on the eastern barrier island, Fort McCree on the western barrier island, and Barrancas on the mainland. Barrancas would be developed into the two connected forts currently known as Fort Barrancas and the Advanced Redoubt. The redoubt was the old Spanish water battery and therefore is the oldest part of the fortification. While the Spanish had their cannons firing through windows or embrasures, the American modification placed the cannons to fire over the walls, allowing greater movement. They added a rifle gallery as well as reinforced walls. Access to the redoubt was through an underground passage that led to the upper fort. The work was begun in 1838 and was completed by 1841. Work on the new construction of the upper fort was begun in 1840 and would take six years to complete. The fort was designed by Joseph Totten, the lead engineer of the Army Corps of Engineers, and it included walls four feet or over a meter thick and 20 feet or over six meters high, a moat surrounding it, and an earthen slope that hid the fort from most land-based artillery. At the beginning of 1861, and on the eve of the Civil War, the fort was commanded by Lieutenant Adam Slemmer, in the absence of his commanding officer, Colonel John Winder, who would later resign his commission and join the Confederate Army. Slemmer was assisted by Lieutenant Jeremiah Gilman, and they led a force of only 50 men whose orders were to prevent the capture of the Pensacola forts. Slemmer would soon realize that the danger was from fellow Americans, and on January 7th, he ordered the drawbridge raised. Just after midnight, a small band of Florida State Militia, led by Colonel William Henry Chase, who had supervised the construction of Barrancas, marched upon the fort. In the tense situation, the militia refused to answer the fort's challenge, so the Union Guards fired a shot to sound the alarm, and quickly reinforcements arrived at the entrance. Chase demanded that the U.S. troops surrender the fort. Instead, Slemmer had his men fire shots to repel the militia. This ended the confrontation with the Florida militia retreating. No one was hurt, and it's actually believed that the shots fired were powder charges, meant only as a sincere warning. 
Still, many people argue that this action was the first opening shots of the war and occurred more than three months before the American Civil War officially started at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. Two days later, the Florida legislature approved an ordinance of secession and declared its independence from the U.S. Amazing Florida Fort No. 5 Pickens and How Geronimo Became an Early Tourist Attraction Just across the mouth of Pensacola Bay on Santa Rosa Island lies Fort Pickens, the other part of Pensacola's impressive defenses. The fort was designed by Baron Simon Bernard, a French military engineer. He was an active supporter of Napoleon, and with the Emperor's abdication, Bernard was banished from France, came to the U.S., and was appointed a Brigadier General of Engineers. Between 1816 and 1830, he designed a number of major forts for the U.S., including nearby Fort McCree. Like Barrancas, Pickens was placed under the management of Colonel Chase of the Army Corps of Engineers and was built between 1829 and 34. It's comprised of more than 21 million bricks, making it the largest fort in Florida at the time. The pentagonal fort with its five bastions was designed to withstand bombardment from both Pensacola Harbor and the Gulf of Mexico, as well as land attack on the island itself. It was named for Andrew Pickens, a planter and slaveholder who was a leader in the South Carolina militia during the American Revolution. The fort was used until 1848 when the army abandoned it. At the start of the Civil War, however, Lieutenant Adam Slemmer, who you'll remember was in command of the U.S. forces at Fort Barrancas, realized that Pickens would provide a more defensible position than the smaller and more vulnerable Barrancas. Slemmer ordered his 50 men to abandon Barrancas, and after destroying the gunpowder and cannons of the fort, he led his men across the bay. All this happened before the official start of the war. The Union forces were able to secure the fort even though nearby Pensacola was in Confederate hands. It was one of only four forts in southern states that were held by Union forces throughout the war. Indeed, two of the other forts were Florida's Fort Jefferson and Fort Zachary Taylor. By the way, Colonel Chase, who had overseen the construction of both forts, would resign his commission and join the Florida militia. Chase wound up being an ironic character when he was put in charge of the failed attempt to capture Fort Pickens, only months after failing to take Barrancas. After the war, the fort played an unusual role in America's Indian Wars. By 1886, the Third Seminole War was long over with the Seminoles either forcibly moved to Oklahoma or hidden in pockets in the Everglades. But Fort Pickens, along with Castillo de San Marcos, would become prisons connected to the conflicts that were still happening in the western U.S. From 1886 to 1888, Geronimo, the Apache shaman and leader, was imprisoned at Fort Pickens along with several of his warriors. Their families were sent to San Marcos. The primary reason that the Apaches were sent clear across the country was to get them out of Arizona Territory, where the authorities were hoping to try them for the deaths of Americans. The reason why the parties were separated had to do with Pensacola residents. The locals realized that Geronimo would be an attraction of sorts, and in February 1887, the army began to allow tourists to visit the fort and to view the occupants. Visitors were required to get a pass at Fort Barrancas to ensure that no one smuggled whiskey to the prisoners. The attraction was considered popular, with dozens of people visiting the isolated fort each week. Eventually, the Apache women and children who had gone to the Castillo came back to be housed at Pickens, and in 1888, all were moved to the Mount Vernon Barracks in Alabama. So this is the end of part one of Florida's Fascinating Forts. Stay tuned for the second part coming in the next few days. Thank you for watching another of my videos. Please leave me a comment about the fort you find most interesting. I'd like to see what you think.